today is John 14, 23 through 27. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teachings. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. So be it. Okay, I do now. We need to remember to keep Teresa in our prayers also. I forgot to mention that. Some of you may have heard on the prayer request, but she fell out of a cherry tree, I assume picking cherries. The limb broke, and she fell. And um, CAT scan looked good, but she has a cracked vertebrae. Is that, that right? So remember her in her prayers. That's why they're, why they're not here today. We'll start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that we can come to you to make our requests known. We thank you for the protection and the love that you pour out upon us. That we are not only loved by you, created by you to be in a relationship with you, but that you have loved us so much that we can say that we're beloved because you would give your son to die for us. We just thank you and praise you for the freedom that we have also to come and worship in this country, Lord. Open our hearts and minds to hear your words not just to hear them, but to apply them to our lives so that we can be the light in this world that you've called us to be. That we realize the mission why we're still here on earth and the hope that we have that we will spend eternity with you and long for that day. But in the meantime, to be a light to the world, to have your concerns, your kingdom come in mind more than our own. And Lord, we just thank you for the protections and the freedoms that we have. We thank you for this blessing of this air-conditioned uh, building to be in today and Lord we just pray for those that don't have the things that we have. May we be good stewards of all that we have to bring glory and honor to you. We pray this in Jesus name. Amen. So since basically the week of Pentecost I've been talking about what the first church looks like and trying to tie some of the things together like the Great Commandment, the Great Commission and God as a father figure and not just a father figure, but as a loving father that maybe even some of you can't comprehend well. And also the person of the Holy Spirit. So when we're singing these songs and stuff, we're not just thinking of a comforter as far as power or anything. But like I was looking forward to my dad coming when he came here. I was longing for that. And we're going to look at that more today. And we are going to get a little bit into Acts 2, but probably not as much as I thought we would. Because we're going to look at Galatians and some other uh, writings first. But I t entitled this, The Outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I want to emphasize today that that's on all believers still today. That's on us because we have a mission just like the mission of the first church, just like the mission of the 12 disciples. We have a mission to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world, to be holy, set apart, obedient children. We have to live a life that way. So that as Peter says, when people see us, even though they want to condemn us for our good behavior, they can't find fault in us. And then they might just, might just ask us why we have the hope that we have, why we have the love that we have. So we've got to be obedient, we've got to be hopeful, we've got to be loving. You ever wonder what it would be like to walk with Jesus, to be there then like the twelve were, like Peter, because we're going to talk about him a lot today. To walk with Jesus, see the mighty miracles that he performed. But yet Jesus said, it is better that if I go away so that the Holy Spirit can come and walk with you each and every day. Now think about that. And how are you living your life? How are we living our lives? You have decided to believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God. So you're born again. You're born of the Spirit. Every believer has the Spirit of God living inside of him. But so much today 
there is division in the body of Christ, trying to think how I want to say these words, over the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And I don't think that division ought to be there. I think that once Pentecost came, the Spirit was poured out, and the Spirit, as Paul says in Corinthians, gives gift accordingly to build up and edify the body. So I am one that believes, and that's why I say it that way, you can believe differently if you want to, that when the outpouring of the Spirit came, came in power, and the Spirit, or not said it, He came in power, and He still should be living your, in your life powerfully, transforming you, molding you into the image of Christ, and doing mighty works, whatever that might be, to bring about the kingdom of God. We should be longing for the day that Jesus Christ returns. And we should be building God's kingdom on this earth until that day by the power and direction of the Holy Spirit. Being God's chosen people, just as the nation of Israel was supposed to be a light to the world, the church is supposed to be that light to the world now. And I need you, you need me, we need each other, because we all have different gifts of the Spirit so that we can be a stronger, united body. So... If you were alive back then, how would you have responded to Jesus' teachings? Would His concerns, His teachings, been your primary concerns? Or would you just continue to live your life as though the Messiah had not come? Jesus is the Messiah, the chosen one, the one that would save people from their sins. And He's not here presently now, He's here in the form of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And I say these things deliberately so you can think of that. So here I am today with the Holy Spirit living in me with the same mission that Jesus had. In fact, Luke begins Acts with saying that Jesus did all these works up until this point. It leaves it continuing, that we are to continue that mission. So let's look at what Peter said before Pentecost. And I'm in Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. Peter said when Jesus was telling him of the passion that he was going to pour out, that he was going to lay down his life, Peter said, no way is that going to happen to you. And Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And as I'm preaching this today, again, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm doing a self-evaluation for me. I'm trying to put myself there and see what Peter thought and what Jesus' answer was to him. Peter was like, no way do we want that to happen to you, God. We're ready for the Messiah to come and everything. We realize that you are the Son of God. We want you to reign. But Jesus said that that wasn't what he came for at this point. He will return. He will reign. But this time he was coming bringing reconciliation. He was bringing an offer to mankind to be made right with God, not holding their sins accountable against them. And we are the ambassadors to bring about that good news, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that God has come to man because there's no way that man can come to God, and He is offering them a pardon if you just believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ. But if we're supposed to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, what does that mean our lives are supposed to look like? So the first question I'm sitting here asking myself, are my concerns as a child of God still the concerns they were before I was a child of God? Do I still worry about what I'm going to eat, where, so forth? Do I worry about my health? Do I worry about sending my kids to college or taking care of my grandkids? How does my life look different than it did before? All those things that I mentioned aren't necessarily bad things. They're probably some good things. But how does my life look different than what it looked before if I'm a new creation in Christ and I should have in my mind the concerns of God because I have the mindset of Jesus? Peter's thought process surely changes and you see that change by the time that Pentecost comes. Jesus continued saying in Matthew 16, He turned His attention to all of the disciples that were there and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whom, whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? 
For the Son of Man is, go is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to what they have done. Well, Peter may not have understood everything fully there, but Jesus died for our sins. And then He left us, and He said He wouldn't leave us orphans, that He would send the Holy Spirit to come and comfort us, to guide us, to be our advocate before the Father, to empower us, to give spiritual gifts. And He was going away, but He would return in glory with His Father's angels, with the angels of heaven's armies, and He would reward each person according to what they have done. Time for me to do some more self-evaluation. What does my life look like? If there's a reward coming, where are my concerns? Where's my thought process? Am I being transformed? Is my mind being transformed? Is God's laws written upon my heart? Am I living them out? Am I being a light to this world? Or am I continuing to just kind of put God into it, living my life for myself, and, oh, I'm a Christian? Or am I consumed with my love for God, all of my heart, my mind, my soul, my strength, that it permeates everything about me and that I can't help but to love my neighbor, even my enemies. I can't help but to think of others over myself when it comes to doing things. And then there's that point that Jesus taught that it was better for him to leave. Just a couple quick verses to, to get some concept of that. In John 16 uh, verse 7, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And as you read Scripture, you'll see that it says Jesus sent the Spirit. You see that He asked the Father to send the Spirit. We see that the, the, the triune uh, deity of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we see for sure that Peter is recognizing that Jesus is God. When, and John, when he breathes upon them, Jesus is letting them know that the Holy Spirit is not just coming from God, but it's coming from Him because they are one. And Jesus prays that we will be one, and we'll get to that in just a minute. That comes in John chapter 17. Backing up to John 14, though, he said, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes, whoever, not the twelve, not the 120 that we'll see in Acts. But whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. Okay, so what did Jesus do? Am I doing that in my life? And they will do even greater things than these. Because I am going to the Father. So if I'll do even greater things in Jesus, if you'll do greater things in Jesus, especially as the body of Christ, then we have to know the Holy Spirit personally. We have to be relying on Him to guide us, to lead us, to change us into the image of Christ. To give me a mindset of Christ, to think of heavenly things rather than my own concerns. A couple verses later, you may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and He will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. So if I have God's concerns on my mind, if I have His laws written in my heart, then how am I living as a Christian, as one that's a little Christ, a one that's like Christ? And I have no excuse because the Spirit of truth has come to abide with me forever and ever and ever. Whom shall I fear? What do I have to worry about? So I said before, I say these promises for all, are all believers, not the 12, not the 120 we read in Acts, not just the early church and then it went away. They're for us still today. That's what I say. So on, in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. So who is the all? Is it the 12 or is it the 120? If you look backwards a few verses in Acts chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, it says they all joined together consistently in prayer. And then it lets us know that along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So they're more than just the twelve. And then we read on, In those days Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. So I'm going to say, I say again. I keep saying, I say it, because you can think a little differently if you want to. 
But when Pentecost came, the power of God, which was already, the Spirit was already with believers, because if you're born again, you're born of the Spirit. But the Spirit of God came powerfully. Why then? To build the church, to usher in God's kingdom, to bring His kingdom back to correction, which won't happen until Jesus returns, but we have the privilege and honor of being a part of that. And to do that, you've got to live a life where you know the Holy Spirit and that you let the Holy Spirit's power move through you. And I'm going to stress this more and more so that you understand that we're no different than those believers, no different than Peter in the fact that God Himself dwells in us. Now, our calling might be a little different. What He's called us to do, the, the gifts that we have may be different because the Spirit gives according to how the Spirit sees fit. But if you're not studying and consuming God's Word and not gathering together in prayer, not relying upon Him, not having a mindset of Christ, then you're probably not going to see the power of the Holy Spirit move in your life like you should. The mission of the church is still the same, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is still the same. I told you I'd get to John chapter 17, so let's look there. Beginning in chapter, verse 1, this is Jesus' prayer for the disciples, and it goes into all believers. Verse 1, after Jesus said this, after He gave these teachings about the Holy, primarily the Holy Spirit coming, and for us not to be afraid, for us to be grafted into the vine for us to be active and growing. After Jesus said this, He looked forward toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify Your Son, that Your Son may glorify You. For You granted Him authority over all people that He might give eternal life to all those that You have given Him. If you're born again, you have eternal life, just like He told Nicodemus in chapter 3. Now this is eternal life that they know you, they know your plans, your kingdom, they are intimate with you, they know you, the one and only true God, because they brought, brought back to a right relationship because of their faith in Jesus. They know Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Verse 4, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. So you've got this glory that Jesus is talking about, and let's read further and see kind of what that means. Because then he starts praying for the twelve. I'm going to drop down to verse 20. Actually, I'm going to say something first and then drop down to 20. Because 20 is where he talks about all believers. He prays for the, the disciples to have the empowering of the Holy Spirit to not be distracted by this world so that they can do the mission that they've set aside. And I don't think we disagree about that. We know what their mission is. But so many times Christians today say, well, my mission's not exactly the same on that. And is it because I'm scared that I will have to sell everything and follow Jesus or He'll call me to a foreign mission field? Well, he might, but He might not. But He's called you to be a witness, especially in your home, in your work, in your church, in your community, just like he called the disciples. So we get down to verse 20. He says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, each one that will come to follow after Pentecost, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe. Are you a child of God, living by the power of the Spirit, being transformed to be in the image of Christ and is your purpose so that the world may believe? Or are you distracted? Do you still have the weights that tie you down and hinder you? Are you being deceived? Or are you living for the kingdom? You don't have anything to worry, not even daily bread, because the Lord God will give it to you. Verse 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me. What does that mean? Have you ever thought about it? This is for all believers. I have given them the glory that you gave me. Now, if you do some commentary reading and stuff here, they compare that 
to the glory of God and say all these things. Well, that's true. It's got nothing to do with the glory of God. It has nothing to do with us being like angels or being little gods or deities or anything else. What is Jesus talking about here? He's talking about our mission to be involved in saving the world. And that's glorious. I'll just use it that way. I have given them the glory that you gave me. So it's not eternal life. It's not adoption into sonship. It's not the privilege of, of spreading the gospel message. Some commentaries will say that it is the Holy Spirit, but I don't read it this way again. I'm going to say I don't again. I think the Holy Spirit is absolutely necessary in this, vital part that you can't have unless you're a believer, but it's the glory of being able to do God's will. His kingdom come, His will be done, that you get to participate even in suffering as Jesus suffered because you don't count your life your own. It was purchased and ransomed back for you. So you give it to God for His glory to be able to be a light to this world so that they may see that the gospel message is true and they come to a knowing salvation of Jesus Christ and God. That's glorious. I have given them the glory that you gave me. Keep reading that they may be one as we are one. <laughs> There's no way I can be one without the empowering of the Holy Spirit. We're to be one body, one mindset, one physically operating unit to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ until He returns. Verse 23, In them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity, which will come, that completion will come, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Think about if we were as focused as the disciples were, so therefore we're as empowered by the Holy Spirit as the disciples were, that maybe, just maybe, we'd be adding to our numbers daily, and maybe, just maybe, Jesus would return. So many Christians don't want that to happen yet. I want to live my life first. I want Jesus to return and I want to spend eternity with Him. And I want my children and my grandchildren and my friends and even my enemies to come to that knowledge. So how can I not want the Holy Spirit to live powerfully through me? And Jesus said to ask and it will be given unto you. Wow, where is my mindset? Am I concerned about human things? Or am I concerned about the kingdom of God coming and God's will to be done? Okay, we'll go to Acts chapter 2. You want to do that? We'll get there. To the day of Pentecost. Peter gets up boldly. He starts preaching. And what does the first thing he do? He quotes from Joel. And we'll probably look at a little video of Joel maybe next week to learn a little bit more about that. A prophet who wrote these words so that we would have them later, and Peter quotes from them. Verse 17, In the last days God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour my spirit out in those days and they will prophesy. Okay. Peter couldn't have known that, that this was what this day was except the Holy Spirit told him this. He did know this also because of the, the gift that the Holy Spirit came and they saw it as an appearance of uh, uh, fiery tongues and then they heard them talking in other languages. But he knew this was the day that he was talking about, but he's not just talking about this day. Last days is all the way up until Jesus Christ returns. It's not the one day. And it, he says here, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Not the 12, not the 120. And what will happen? Your sons and your daughters, young men, old men, servants, both men and women... He says twice that, that God will pour out His Spirit in those days and they will what? Prophesy. 
Paul writes a letter to Corinthians and tells them not to argue over tongues and everything, to, to seek prophecy. But then he says the greatest thing of all, which Jesus has already said, is love. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So as I'm, 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 as I'm examining my life, am I loving my neighbor? Am I thinking about them more than myself? Who is my neighbor? Everyone. That I am consumed with them knowing Jesus Christ. So that's what drives me. And then the world just happens around it. But my focus is His kingdom come, His will be done. And I have the Spirit of God living in me to enable me to do this. Where I don't worry about the rest of the world. I worry about my mission. Can I say that? Do you agree? So are we living that way? Longing for the day that Jesus Christ returns. So I want to go to Galatians now. I'm already out of Acts chapter 2. I want to see what Paul writes to the churches in Galatia. Several churches in this province area, they're Gentiles, they're not Jews. Because the outpouring of the Holy Spirit came to the Jews at Pentecost. But it didn't just stop there. In Galatians chapter 1, starting in verse 1, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me, to the churches in Galatia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to do what? To rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of God of will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Glory forever to God. Jesus has glory. He gives His glory to us so that be, we can be one, so that we can proclaim the gospel message, so that all might be saved, including Gentiles, including us now, to rescue us from this present evil age. Well, wait a minute. Jesus didn't take me with Him. He left us there. He didn't orphan us. He told us not to fear, not to worry, not let our hearts be troubled. He would send the, the Holy Spirit, the Advocate, the Helper, to be with us forever. And He would return and take us home. So my mission has to be the same. So if I'm supposed to be rescued from this present evil age, what does that look like? to not have my mind set on the things of this world as I used to think about, but to think of heavenly things. Because I am consumed by this because the Holy Spirit opens up the words here. Because the Word is life. It is Jesus. And I am to become like that so that I can participate in that glorious part of spreading the gospel message to the world. I'm going to go back to Acts for just a minute. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says what? I repeat that verse all the time. The apostle said, At this time are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? No. We're going to usher in the kingdom of heaven instead. You don't need to worry about any of these things. Verse 8, But you will receive power. Not just receive the Holy Spirit, but you will receive dynamite explosive power dunamis did I pronounce it right? thank you <laughs> dynamite power that's my Greek scholar if you don't know it dynamite explosive power you don't need to know where it comes from how it works anything else just that it explodes in your life that you're not who you were before because you are a new creation in Jesus Christ you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the other ends of the earth. So I took you to Galatia because we're getting to the other, other ends of the earth now. Paul is going out establishing churches because he doesn't want to destroy the kingdom anymore. He wants to live for King Jesus. He's fervent about it, and it's going to cost him his life. He doesn't care. He will pour out his life like a drink offering. Then in verse 22 it says, Beginning from, the, from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us, for one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. We see the word witness again. And then in Acts chapter 2, 
Verse 32 and 33, God has raised, this is part of Peter's message, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear, the Holy Spirit in power, so that we will be His witnesses. But the only thing is, and the reason I said those verses, is because, see, the word witness equals martyr. It means that I am so determined to proclaim this truth that it does not matter to me if I die for the cause. It's where we get our word martyr from. And many times in Scripture you'll see it that way. I don't care about my own life. All I care about is proclaiming Jesus Christ because it is the power of salvation to men. So how can I keep silent? How can I not want my children and their children to be saved? And now His laws are written on my heart. And now I have the power to live where I couldn't have lived by the law before. It only condemned me and showed me how terrible I really was. I am. (laughs) But by the grace of God through faith I can be saved. It is a gift from God. A gift to be not taken lightly and to be used wisely. We went over Hebrews chapter 11 some in the past weeks. That's the hall of fame of heroes and heroines. And we saw how Father Abraham fitted into that too. If you read the end of that chapter, starting in verse 39, and I'm going to read it into chapter 12 as there's no divisions. These, we're going to say to these witnesses, it's implied here, were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, what should we do so that we can proclaim the gospel message, so that we can be His hands and feet, knowing that we have the power to do this job, that He didn't orphan us and that He would return, and that we're even going to receive glory and we're going to be rewarded for what we've done or not done. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, what? Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. As we have a mission. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. How? By fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, which I think Jesus said, I think, that the Spirit would reveal him to us would reveal Jesus for the joy set before him he endured the cross scorning its shame he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart in your struggle against sin you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood even if it costs you your life You want to, you have to be a witness for Jesus if he's really, as Peter says in chapter 2, that God has made this Jesus Messiah and Lord. If Jesus is who he says he is, if you believe he is the Messiah, the chosen one, the one that will save their people from their sins, then he is your Lord. And as you read his word, as you pray, as you study, as we come together, you will be empowered by the Holy Spirit and you will become more like Christ so that you can live a life like Christ, even to the point of death, if that's what it takes, to proclaim the gospel message to bring salvation to man. What a glorious, glorious thing that we are partakers of that even the Old Testament saints would have longed for and were made perfect with them. So was this outpouring? Trying to present my my opinion from Scripture. Was this outpouring on the 12? Was it on the 120? Or was it on us? And if it's on us as well, those in those days, plus everyone that that would hear from that message, then are we living like the Acts 2 church? 
I have to examine myself and I have to go to the throne of God and ask Him to forgive me where I've fallen short. I didn't say if, I said where. And empower me to live more for His kingdom, for His concerns rather than my own. Acts 2 verse 36 to 40, Therefore let all Israel, including the Gentiles which we see in Galatians, be assured of this, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Oh, thank goodness there's forgiveness. There's grace. There's mercy. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized. And I just want to point out here that as you study Scripture, that you know that baptism is not a part of salvation. It's a sign that you've been saved. And that's all I'll say now. We'll keep moving on. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sin, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift to be a messenger of to be empowered, to live with God, to be one as Jesus prayed with God. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. I believe that includes us. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded them. What did he warn them and plead with them? Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. The same thing that Paul said. You can't keep living your life like you lived before. You've got to live a set-apart holy life so that others will see Christ in you. And then don't forget that God lives with you so that you can live powerfully whatever that looks like in your life because you're called to do even greater things than Jesus did in His ministry, whatever that looks like. I want to go back reading some in Galatians, and that's where we'll end up. Remember verse 5 read, The Lord, this is Galatians chapter 1, The Lord Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of, our, of God and Father, to whom all glory be forever and ever. Amen. We continue on. I am astonished that you so quickly are deserting the one who called you to live in grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. <laughs> Early church. And people are already distracting them, telling them these different things. And in this case, which we're not talking about that here so much, but in this case, they thought they had to have works. They were relying on works, not relying on faith in Jesus Christ alone. But what I'm wondering is if we think, having another, there's all kind of other gospels in the church today. But are we listening to another gospel saying that the Holy Spirit's power is not the same now? And like I said, study it. You'll see a lot of teachings on the fact that the power of the Holy Spirit was that way at Pentecost and not made to be that way today. And I, I, I disagree with that. I don't want to put words in your thought process. I say the power of the Holy Spirit is the same today as it was then. Our calling is the same. The mission is the same. So we need to focus on it. That's how I feel. This is no, really no gospel at all, verse 7. Evidently some people are throwing you into confusion and trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Isn't that what Satan does? Isn't he a deceiver? But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would, be, would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Whether I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how in intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God who set me apart from my mother's room and called me by grace was pleased to reveal His Son in me so that I might preach Him. 
Those words you can apply to yourself. Alan was set apart in his mother's womb. He was called by God's grace because God was pleased to reveal His Son to him so that I might preach the gospel. Well, yeah, I'm up here preaching, but you should preach every opportunity that you get. Who you were before you came to know Jesus Christ and the new creation that you are after that and how much God loves you and how much God loves them. That He would be willing to send His one and only Son to die for them. Wow. That we can partake in that. That we can be ambassadors. That we can tell of the gospel message, the love of God. Wow. So let's keep reading. What does Paul say? You know this verse. I'm skipping to chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But Christ, He lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. The life I live in my body now. I don't worry about these other things. I'm empowered by the Spirit, and the Spirit is revealing God's truth to me, His plan of salvation, so that I can be transformed like a caterpillar into a butterfly. <clears throat> the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I did not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after be, beginning by means of the Spirit? Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain is, if it really was in vain? So again I ask, does God give you His Spirit and work miracles among you? Huh. By the works of the law or by believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed among, along with Abraham, the man of faith. I don't know, I think about Lowell Bonnie, who I think about, but just because he said he saw in me doing this and I didn't see it. <laughs> but how would you feel if the person who led you to Jesus Christ and, and that coming to God, not worrying about anything else, came back to you and wrote a letter to you and said, you foolish Alan, look at how you're living your life now. You're not living by the power of the Spirit. You're, you're living something else. Wow. What a slap in the face. How am I living my life? Am I seeing these miracles? Am I promoting the kingdom? Do I have God's concerns in my mind and my heart? I have the freedom to choose whatever I want. Am I living by the power that saved me from an eternity in hell? Or am I restricting that power? If we keep reading and skip to Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, But when the time, set time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are His Son, God sent the Spirit of His Son into your hearts. The Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. And I already did a message on this. Four times you'll see that. Each time it's a prayer to God to give me strength for the mission that's in front of me. Three times by Jesus and one time here because my mission is the same. To be like Jesus in this world, to proclaim the gospel message to those who are lost and dying in their sin. Verse 7, So you are no longer a slave but God's child, and since you are His child, God has made you also an heir. Formerly when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, 
How is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? How is it you're still trying to live your life the way you did before? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? And then in chapter 5, verse 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you will... If you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all because they were relying on that for their salvation. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. If we're not living as children of God by the power of the Spirit, are we alienating Christ? You have fallen away from grace for through the Spirit... We eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope for. So if we're doing that, we're living that way. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith, not just faith, but expressing itself through love. How you live your life. How am I living my life? How is springs of living water living as a church. Dropping down to verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, facts, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And the problem is, as I get, and I'm so you might, I don't know. Oh, well, I check this one off. It's not a check off. <laughs> It's am I be living by the Spirit so I am living like Christ and can others see that because of the way I live my life in love? That's the proof. Jesus said it. They will know you because of your love. Is that how I am living? I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, I got most of those checked off. I'm okay. Well, here's the contrast. But... The fruit of the Spirit, because the Spirit is producing fruit in my life, just as in John 14, Jesus says that He is the vine and we're the branches. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I got a big problem with that last one. Uh, again, I didn't say that out loud, did I? Sorry. Against such there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, if you live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit, walking every day step by step. You don't reach adulthood overnight, but you do reach it. We are supposed to reach a mindset and a life that looks like Christ in this world. Is that the progression that you're on? Is that the mindset that you have? Or is there something hindering you or some sin entangling you that you need to get rid of today? Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. I hope you see the direction that I've tried to tie this together. I hope you can see, as we've already talked about, the Holy Spirit as a person a person of the Godhead living in you for a purpose of living through you. Oh, how the Old Testament saints would have longed to have what you have. You are a child born of God, not under the penalty of the law, not saved by its power, because it only would condemn you, but saved by grace. And God continues to pour out His grace upon grace upon grace upon His children. And one day, Jesus will come back and say, Come, come to me. Wow. Let us live like we're 
children led by the Spirit, walking each and every step empowered by Him. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that you have such a wonderful, glorious plan that Jesus would be obedient even to the death on a cross, humiliated, abandoned, betrayed, under terrible torment, not just physically, but because he was, for the first time ever, taken apart from you, separated from you, so that we could be brought back to you. Lord, let us help not take this so, so lightly. To realize that you are living in us. Father, pour your spirit out in power. As we seek you, Father, cleanse us. Help us to walk. Help us to see the things that we need to get rid of. Help us to be united in mind and body as a church for our mission for you. Lord, we pray for those who do not believe. We pray, as the prayer request was made earlier, to soften their hearts. And Lord, we thank you that we are so privileged and we have everything available because we are heirs to your kingdom. We have everything available for this mission that you set before us. You didn't equip us and not empower us. You called us, you knit us together, you've empowered us, and we just long for the day that Jesus Christ will return. Help us to be living each and every moment as though it were our last. We thank you and praise you in his precious name. Amen.